Greetings, this is an overview of the online course Self-Determination in the Post-Colonial World. In this session I'm just going to introduce the course, what it is, why it is, and something about its method and the course content. First of all this is a course which examines the implications of the international recognition of the right of a people to self-determination, an act which defines the start of the post-colonial era. In practical terms, it studies themes of non-compliance, uh, ongoing domination, ongoing imperialism, and resistance, that is to say, the um, acts of people to uh, realise their right to self-determination, because imperialism and the denial of self-determination persist under other names in the post-colonial era. Indeed, that is why self-determination is such a living issue today. I say this study is very necessary because it rarely happens in the former colonial cultures because the states and the oligarchies, including the corporate media, which increasingly constrain academic work in these cultures, typically ignore the former and deny the latter. Western international relations scholarship is typically herded into neocolonial boxes of neorealism, so-called hegemonic stability, the right to protect and so on. That makes it very difficult for students of self-determination and resistance. Yet there's a pressing need for students in all cultures to fully examine contemporary norms and relations, especially as regards the ongoing issues of domination and resistance. So this course may be either an online reading course or an on-campus assess course. That is to say, all of the course materials are being placed online, linked through the Centre for Counter-Hegemonic Studies based in Sydney. And from 2021 onwards, some associated universities may also run this course as an assessed option. That is to say, the uh, required work and the assessment will be done through those universities for credit towards their degree studies. And the centre will post um, the list of associated universities who want to run it in that sort of way. So that is to say, anyone can freely read or audit, as they sometimes say, this course through the online materials, looking at the the uh, unit outline, uh, getting the readings from PDFs online, getting the seminar notes and uh, watching these presentations or lectures. And in some cases it will be offered for credit through a local university. I've posted online here the, uh, the web address of the Counter for Centre Hegemonic Studies and where you can find all of those materials. So initially let's have a look at self-determination across cultures. Um, I'll be making an emphasis on this cross-cultural comparison because it helps us conceptualise what resistance is and what self-determination means in practical terms. Notice in this video that some languages have their own words for and their own emphasis on self-determination. For example, in Tetum, the lingua franca of East Timor, Ukun Razikan, means self-determined and self-governing. And note also the mixed use of related terms such as independence, freedom, anti-colonial and self-determination. They are different terms but they are linked in many ways and that deserves some study. Ecuador exporta petróleo crudo e importa combustible. Vaya usted a ver. El colonialismo. Por eso hay que insistir. Lo que en América Latina se ha iniciado de nuevo es el mismo proceso que quedó pendiente de Bolívar, de San Martín, de Ojigui, de Artiga. La independencia. Nelson Mandela did not mean that he is only a freedom fighter for his people, but for all peoples of the world who are suffering from oppression. Uh, with our people, they all know his saying that the freedom of South Africa will be incomplete until the Palestinians get their freedom. Because just like ourselves, they are fighting for the right of self-determination. Penentuan nasib sendiri menurut pemahaman dasar pada saat perjuangan untuk pembebasan itu sebenarnya lebih pada 
pembebasan total dan lengkap. Kalau menurut saya, self determination atau uh, ukurasikan menurut saya itu adalah bebas dari segala uh, penjajah ya. Dalam arti di sini, uh, kalau kita berbicara tentang ukurasikan, jadi masyarakat itu bebas dari segala macam penindasan. Portanto, estamos a organizar esse serviço é uma constituição que o povo poder aprender o que é uma independência. A independência tem que trabalhar. Se um gajo quer uma independência e não quer trabalhar, é a mesma coisa. Qualquer dia temos que pedir, dar sempre as mãos, pedir a esmola ao mundo todo. E essa coisa de pedir a esmola tem, tem que acabar, porque nós estamos a continuar assim esse serviço para acabar com a nossa esmola para o mundo. This course is uh, an improved, refocused version of units of study I taught for many years at the University of Sydney, initially called the Political Economy of Human Rights and then Human Rights in Development and then Human Rights in International Development. There the focus was development through themes of human rights. Now I focused that attention to human rights down to the founding principle of the International Bill of Rights, that is to say, the right of a people to self-determination. In the earlier courses, the aim was to examine contemporary notions of human rights engaged with distinct perspectives of economic liberalism, social democracy and socialism. The frame of reference was the experience of developing countries, their trade, aid and strategic relations with the wealthy countries. And the rights issues studied included imperialism and self-determination, neoliberalism, crises and rights, land rights, food security, the rights to education and health, fair trade and labour rights, and economic self-determination through a lens of human rights. In this course, as I said, there's a focus on self-determination and resistance, but many of those themes from those earlier courses um, are picked up also in this um, unit of study. Now, one important uh, consideration here is that resistance studies have been repressed in Western cultures. For example, in my own experience, I was expelled from the University of Sydney after 20 years working there, mainly due to my refusal to disown this graphic, which documented a massacre by Israeli forces in Gaza, in Palestine, and was instructing students on how to read sources, particularly in contemporary controversies. And I decided to make a focus on the study of reading contemporary controversies and how to use sources rather than simply avoid controversies. Well, the university managers at the University of Sydney who receive large sums of undisclosed money each year from Israeli linked organizations deemed it offensive to Israel and so uh, instituted a misconduct process against me. And when publicizing this case, they stressed that there was a swastika superimposed on the Israeli flag, which you can see at the far left, while hiding the fact that this actual graphic was about a massacre of Palestinians, one of the massacres in Gaza. They didn't report that at all. So I've given some references to this in case you want to look that up. Now, the wider Israel lobby, of course, is an important issue an important influence has become an important influence on academia and political life particularly in western countries um, and that's because israel as a colony in palestine has become very insecure about the way it's seen around the world and so the israel lobby has spent considerable time and effort trying to vilify as racist public figures who criticize israel the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance has had some success in its attempts to extend the definition of anti-Semitism to criticism of Israel and support for Palestinian rights. Um, an Israel lobby group in the USA under the guise of protecting Jewish students has branded as biased more than 200 academics who supported the boycott against Israel on the basis of apartheid in that colony. Academics and teachers have been hounded from their positions in the US, the UK, Australia, New Zealand because of their comments on Israel, including those who've raised legitimate academic questions about ethno-nationalist settler colonialism and victims becoming perpetrators. And that uh, includes Jewish writers who haven't been immune from those attacks. And some of those um, Jewish writers and academics have hit back saying that unfounded allegations of anti-Semitism are used to cover up Israeli apartheid. Why is that such a, a big issue in Western countries in particular? 
um, a group of more than 200 Brit British academics a few years ago complained of the lobby's repeated attempts to link criticism of Israel and support for the Palestinian people with some form of a racism, anti-Semitism, they call it. These moves were outrageous interference with free expression and direct attacks on academic freedom. That group said, we wish to express our dismay at this attempt to silence campus discussion about Israel, including its violation of the rights of Palestinians for, for more than 50 years. It's with disbelief that we witness explicit political interference in university affairs under the thin disguise of concern about anti-Semitism. In the USA, uh, the former President Donald Trump in 2019 signed an executive order to withhold funds from universities which did not do enough to stop anti-Semitic practices, which includes, according to them, criticism of Israel. Defense of the Israeli colony in Palestine is therefore taken very seriously, precisely because Israel works as the extended hand of Western imperialism in the Middle East. And let's listen to the current president, Joe Biden, some years ago, he's repeated this um, since, saying that were there not an Israel, the USA would have to invent an Israel. If we look at the Middle East, I think it's about time we stop those of us who support, as most of us do, Israel in this body, for apologizing for our support for Israel. There's no apology to be made. None. It is the best three billion dollar investment we make were there not an israel the united states of america would have to invent an israel to protect her interest in the region the united states would have to go out and invent an israel so that example i think illustrates the need for greater study of resistance in face of the type of oppression that occurs particularly in western countries Western cultural repression of studies generally in imperialism, self-determination and resistance indicate a need and not just a need in Western cultures. There is excessive deference to Western intellectual trends in many other countries, which creates similar deficiencies. Even in some countries under attack, there's academic benchmarking with American British universities because on the ranking systems developed by the Americans and the British, they seem to be at the top. For similar reasons, international discussions about war, terrorism, sanctions, which are better called unilateral coercive measures, and other interventions tend to revolve around the Western pretexts rather than the actual power plays involved, let alone the study of the resistance strategies to deal with those interventions. Yet there are many lessons from international resistance, such as those from the struggle against apartheid in South Africa, which might inform struggles against apartheid in Palestine. That's an important issue, in my opinion. Let's have a look at an example. The example of Western intervention in Afghanistan, the invasion and two decades of occupation of Afghanistan. Now, in the Western conventional analysis, which is still put out, for example, including by NGOs such as Amnesty International, which has become very closely tied to the US State Department, at least the liberal version of that State Department. Um, there are, this analysis explains Western pretexts. Well, the occupation, the NATO groups, uh, the US occupation is there to fight terrorism, to remove a Taliban regime, to engage in state building, to protect the rights of Afghan women and girls, it's said these days. So Miss International, some years ago, backed that NATO occupation of Afghanistan with billboards saying to NATO, keep the progress going. This pretext that somehow or other the occupation was there for the rights of Afghan women and girls. Now, in critical Western studies, there is a taking apart of those rationales, criticizing them, saying they were insincere, they hadn't achieved what they said they were going to achieve, it didn't really add up. But better than that, we have critical geopolitical studies, sometimes uh, promoted by some more uh, open, uh, let's say, honest. Uh, analysts on the Western side, such as the former Colonel Lawrence Wilkerson, who pointed out that the US occupation of Afghanistan is really mainly to position uh, the US role in that part of the world in Central Asia to undermine and contain the rise of China. And Wilkerson has been interviewed and said 
many things along these sorts of lines. So geopolitical studies sidelines those rationales, those false pretexts, and highlights what used to be called the great game. That is to say, the overarching strategy that's going on. In this case of Washington placing itself to try and disrupt the rise of China and to block its uh, Belt and Road, its extension westwards, its influence with the rest of the world, particularly in Eurasia. Now we have a fourth way of looking at this, resistance studies, which examine strategies and tactics to oppose, delegitimize and eject occupation armies from the region and to penetrate that ideological battle that's going on there and the pretext that the new names that are given for imperialism and colonialism these sorts of days. There's an interesting aside to this, which I think um, we might recognize from the great his, uh, Israeli historian Ilan Pape, who his famous book was The Ethnic Cleansing of Palestine. But he pointed out when he moved to Britain that when he first arrived in Oxford, he was very impressed by the elegant articulation in perfect English of the experts on our area, that is to say, in the Middle East, in Palestine. We felt inarticulate, he said, because English was his second language and therefore less knowledgeable. Then we began to examine the content and see that it was full of ignorance, prejudice and superficiality. So let's see beyond that elegant articulation to look at the substance of some of these analyses. So an overview of the method in this course, the method of teaching has its focus on political economic structures, exploring competing paradigms or, or if you like, different worldviews with a reference point in the post-colonial values of independence and self-determination. There's a special focus in this unit of study on the use of evidence in international controversies. The learning objectives are there in the assessed version, but they have to be um, confirmed by the institutions that are teaching that as an assessed course. And I have put into this um, unit of study a separate method module, a six part method module called Method Notes for Political Economic Analysis. There will be a separate um, set of seminar slides on this and a separate video to walk students through it. That'll be interwoven into the substance of this course with separate seminar notes and video presentations. Here's an outline of the method notes for political economic analysis. I want to start with um, ontology, epistemology and methodology in a general sense and then move into concepts, theory and evidence to look at the common constructivist approaches, what are called arguments in Western social sciences these days. Thirdly, to look at sources, how to use um, primary, diverse and independent sources, as opposed to what's pretty much the Wikipedia model these days, which is to say, to refer defer to secondary and reliable sources, a, a misleading um, approach which is rejected by most academics but uh, let's look at the reasons why that Wikipedia model is so flawed and so um, unreliable. Fourthly to look at systematic versus anecdotal evidence, the proper use of evidence including systematic social evidence surveys, examples and so on. How do we make use of those different forms of evidence? Fifthly, to look at bias and admissions against interest, that is to say, the use of bias material. Bias material um, in many respects can be dismissed, but it can be used also. In what circumstances should we use it? And finally, to look at Wikipedia, the social media, the proliferation of so-called fact checkers and compromised sources. How do we read those sources? And in particular, how do we read those sources which tend to dominate and to be very insistent in uh, international controversies? It's important that students get the skills to be able to read sources in controversies where there is something that I call vexatious propaganda, the repetitive use of um, bias sources. So finally, the course content, just a brief overview of the, the types of issues that I'll look at in this course and um, 12 units, 12 separate seminars. First of all, this presentation, an overview of self-determination in the post-colonial world and what the unit is about. Secondly, a historical analysis of where self-determination, where the principle came from by looking at the history of imperialism, then how self-determination developed as a recognized principle in the 20th century, and then an additional uh, module on human development, an important alternative 
to the, the dominant hegemonic neoliberalism, which emphasizes economic growth and has linked it into imperial development. How did this principle of self-determination emerge? The third module, resistance in the post-colonial world. Why has resistance become such an important theme in the former colonies? What are its main features? This is an analytical question linked to the third module, which could be the substance, for example, of a, a research essay. Fourthly, hegemonic neoliberalism, its character and costs. This is about what has been called neoliberalism in the late 20th century and the early 21st century, but we have to link it into um, the ongoing reality of imperialism, particularly in Western discourses to try and justify new forms of domination. And the analytical question here is, um, let's explain the main differences between neo-Marxist theories of imperialism, which emphasized the role of huge monopolistic companies, and the neo-realist um, North American really theory of hegemonic stability, which was trying to compete with the, the neo-Marxist theories. In this uh, module, I'm going to go through some of the history, particularly of Anglo-American neoliberalism or liberalism. Fifthly, and here's where we start to look more at particular studies, um, a study of regional integration using the Americas and using the, the Venezuelan revival of the idea of the integration of the Americas, the integration of our Americas, of Latin America and the Caribbean, that is to say the Americas, the two thirds of the Americas that are not the United States of America and Canada. And that process of, uh, of studying regional integration in the Americas gives us some other ideas of the possibilities of regional integration elsewhere. But the focus here is on the Americas and the analytical question is explain the key differences between the Washington led Pan-Americanism, a separate current, and the Latin American Bolivarian view of American integration. This is a, a parallel currency, if you like, over more than a century, which illustrates some of the tensions between a type of integration of domination and an independent, independent or emancipatory view of integration. In the sixth module, I look at independent small nations using the example of East Timor or Timor-Leste, which is a very small country which got its independence in the beginning of the, uh, or, or reclaimed its independence at the beginning of the 21st century and gives us some insight into the question of the so-called lost causes. How is it possible that a very small country which had maintained its resistance through um, multiple occupations, multiple colonizations, could reclaim its independence in the early 21st century? What might be the lessons there for other small colonized nations? The seventh module, land reform and indigenous land um, in Melanesia, in the, the Pacific Island states of, of Papua New Guinea, of Vanuatu, of the Solomon Islands, where um, despite colonization, customary land ownership has survived through that whole period and yet still emerges under threat to the corporate greed for taking over large tracts of land for um, agricultural monocultures, for example. So this, this involves a study of Melanesian indigenous customary land and how there, there is this conflict now in the 21st, 21st century between those customary landowners and the corporate agendas in the, in the Melanesian uh, nations. And there's a, there's a challenge there to liberal views of property rights and development and land reform from this um, traditional customary landowner um, ideas. So there's an important polemic in the, this part of the world. Public health systems, using the example of Cuba with one of the most famous public health systems, what have, has the Cuban experience shown us about the value of strong public health systems and what do public health systems do best? And that's an important study. It has implications for every society, particularly in this period after we've been through a, a devastating pandemic. The ninth module, the colonization of Palestine. What are the elements of an apartheid state and why is the Israeli colony in Palestine now considered to be an apartheid state? Once again, looking at the case study of Palestine and the Israeli colony, but looking more broadly at the, the question of apartheid and what constitutes apartheid and why it is that we can make those links across the experiences of uh, apartheid in South Africa and apartheid in Palestine. <laughs> 
the 10th module, The New Middle East Wars and Humanitarian Intervention. That is to say, the series of wars uh, initiated by Washington in the 21st century, beginning with the invasions of Afghanistan and Iraq, then the dirty wars in Iraq and Syria and Libya, and the siege on Yemen, the ongoing ethnic cleansing in Palestine. What is it that links those wars together? And what about these pretexts of humanitarian intervention that have been driven as, as pretexts to carry on this type of process across so many countries in the Middle East in the last two decades? The 11th module, food security, or to do with the right to food. And um, as I explain when introducing human development in, in week two, the, this opens up a question of the means of development. That is to say, in human rights terms, in contemporary human rights agreements, there is substantial consensus around issues such as the right to education, the right to health, the right to food. But the big debates come in when it comes to the means of achieving those sorts of rights. So in the case of food security, we have one of those big polemics where the liberal idea of free trade, so-called open markets, which has been rather muted in terms of food compared to other areas of international trade. But nevertheless, we can examine the limitations of food security ideas based on liberal free trade by looking at the, the particular experiences of countries that have rejected that idea and have built in more autonomous or food sovereignty ideas of food security. And finally, in module 12, development strategies and human capacity. And the, the analytical question here sets up a, an interesting argument to start with. In developmental terms, why is it that human capacity has proven itself more important than natural resources in a world where often we find these big arguments around um, battles over natural resources, over land, over food security, over oil and gas and energy. Yet really the success stories in human history in terms of development have been far more to do with the development of human capacity and the building of um, a great capacity through uh, technology, education. We see it in countries like Singapore and Japan and Cuba, countries which are very deficient in natural resources, but have done some remarkable things. So that's the substance of the, the course content here. In summary, the international recognition of the principle of self-determination, I say, marked the turning point in contemporary history. That is to say, the end of the colonial era, the beginning of a new of new ideological struggles in the post-colonial colonial era. And this does deserve study. Studies of imperialism, self-determination resistance, though, are quite rare in Western cultures, where increasing corporization of universities links them to the normative ambitions of their states and their oligarchies. These studies are grounded by an emphasis on political economic method, including a focus on structural forces and ideological contests, and a special emphasis on uh, the, the, um, the use of evidence and the, the reading of particular forms of evidence. So this course can be read freely, or as they say, sometimes audited, or taken as an assessed four credit unit of study at particular associated universities. It examines the living idea of self-determination through persistent themes of domination and resistance across many cultures.